Welcome to First Unitarian Church. I'm so glad to see all of you today. Welcome to those joining us online. We're glad you're here as well. We have a lot of announcements, but we're, we actually got to cut it all because we ran a little long at 9 o'clock, and I know y'all want to get outside to see the activities fair. It's happening! Woohoo! Um, at, the, at the offertory, I'm going to come around and give each one of you a little card that looks like this. The purpose of this is for you to go around and see every table at our activities fair, get it stamped, and you'll be entered to win a $50 gift card to Beans and Brews, right? But now here's the trick is you've got to go visit all the tables. Don't go hang out with your buddies at your one table, right? Go hear everybody because all of our teams need volunteers. Now, when you found your volunteer opportunities for this year, we want you to come back here on Tuesday night. 6.30 is our first team's night of the year. This is when all of our volunteers come together. We'll have pizza at 6.30 in Elliott Hall. Then we'll split up and go get to work as teams. Um, this is our, our big night once a month where we figure out what needs to be done, what are the volunteer jobs to do, and everybody's involved. Um, today is the last day to take the search committee's survey. As you know, we're in search for a new senior minister. We want to hear from everybody. Young and old, all, everybody across the congregation, um, we, want it, we want you to take the survey and let us know what you would like to see in the future of your church. But today's the last day. You need about 20 minutes to do this survey, so like, give yourself some time, okay? All right, moving on. October 22nd. Who knows what's happening on October 22nd? Yes, you do. It's the auction. It's our church auction. This is the biggest fundraiser of the church year. We want everybody to come. Uh, we have tickets for sale at the auction table. Uh, we also are looking for sponsors. We're looking for people to donate either art or your vacation home or an experience, cooking Whatever it is that you do, uh, we want you to contribute. And you can talk to my buddy, Becky Heal. Yes. You can talk to her or any of her auction team that are working so hard to put this event together. Now, we also would like for you next week after this service to hang out for just a few minutes while we record part of this year's auction, what is it, video? The auction video. Some of y'all will remember the hoop that we had last year with this video, and we want to do it again, but we want to include all of you. So plan to hang out just a few extra minutes next week after service. I did that really fast. Did I do them all? <laughs> well, you wouldn't know, right? <laughs> okay, so now you have to go and talk to the tables, and they'll f fill you in on whatever it is I just missed. <laughs> For now, after our speed race through the announcements, we're ready to begin. Let's find our quiet space. Feel the energy and the love in this room, this place that we set aside for our community to serve the world. Our chalice lighting this morning by Lois Van Leer. We light this chalice on the brink of a new day. 
letting go of what has been, open and hopeful for what may come, renewed, restored, ready. Ready to live life fully anew. May we move forward with intention. David, what's our hymn number? Uh, 107. 107. No, 1007. Teal hymnal. 1007. Would you rise in body or in spirit as we sing together? Now, is this a new hymnal that's in the pew, David? (coughs) Say goodbye to them. They all disappeared this week. Why is that, David? Because they're not theirs. They're not. (laughs) Who do these hymnals belong to, David? They belong to the choir. The choir? They get them back. Why doesn't the congregation have them? Because we haven't bought any yet. (laughs) How can we do that, David? Because I don't have the money. (laughs) Come on. How can we buy them? They have the money. Oh, they have the money? If they, were, if they were to have money today, what could they do? Come see the choir table out of, out of the activities there. Can they buy one at the choir table? Yes, you can buy one. Put your name in it. And we can put them in the pews? And then we'll put them in the pews. And then we can sing out of them all the time. Right. Oh, my God. I learned very early in life that something was different about me. The first example I have is from kindergarten. I tried enticing my classmates into joining my tomboy club, a club for girls who wanted to be boys. (laughs) 
But despite my best efforts, I spent most of the recesses alone and remained the only member of the club for the rest of the year. By the time I was in middle school, I hit my full stature of five foot six as a sixth grader. I weighed just under 150 pounds and could, and could bench press as much. My nicknames became queer slurs, and I was referred to as It and Hulk on a regular basis. The bullying was merciless, and the fights, though almost always one-sided, not my side, were plentiful. The principal and the guidance counselor's offices felt like they had a revolving door for me. In high school, the bullying had settled down, but by then, I was getting very confusing crushes on both boys and girls. One minute, I was in love with Brent Van Camp from my local LDS ward, and the next minute, uh, it was the muscular Kathleen Dawes from the girls' basketball team. Sadly, it was the late 90s, and I was living in Redneckville, Florida. So there weren't any examples of healthy queer folk happily living their lives. There was only Jesus. And despite his Birkenstock footwear, he was considered terminally single, or secretly married to Mary Magdalene, depending on whether or not you wanted to reference Jesus Christ Superstar or your local Baptist minister. Life only got more confusing as I considered where to attend college. Uh, if I stayed in Florida, I would, be a, I would have a full ride scholarship, but considering how nightmarish my home life was, my internal feelings of self-preservation said I needed to do everything in my power to get the hell out of Florida. So as a Mormon child with straight A's, I made the obvious choice. BYU, <laughs> 2,000 miles away from Florida. While I was there, I remained mostly closeted, with few exceptions, despite continuing to have genuine feelings for both men and women. Years pass. I moved back to Florida to teach for a few years, and then again back to Utah for grad school. And then in 2011, I was in Canada visiting family when I saw Chaz Bono on Dancing with the Stars. The way he described what it meant to be trans made my whole life start to make sense to me. Unfortunately, I was still very, very deeply entrenched in Mormonism. I knew I wasn't straight, but dealing with my gender identity felt like an impossible and an overwhelming situation. I held out. I was hoping I would find a husband who wouldn't be disgusted with me being incredibly masculine and a little bisexual. Um, once I knew who I was, however, it became harder and harder to pretend and isolate myself. I was experiencing gender dysphoria, anxiety, and depression. In January of 2015, I had top surgery, but still continued to attend LDS services and Relief Society, uh, and refrained from starting testosterone. In November of that same year, the church announced its baptism exclusionary policy for children of same-gender parents. The suicides of people in my community skyrocketed. I felt acute despair. Then I was asked to attend a meeting with my stake president where he implied that the true cost of my salvation would be for me to not fully transition. I realized the doctrine of the church was not going to change for me, no matter what was necessary for me to stay safe and healthy. Obedience was, was more important to the leadership than my life. That conversation was the nail in my proverbial LDS coffin. In late 2016, I drove home to meet with my Zionist Mormon parents in Missouri to let them know that I was leaving the faith. It was one of the hardest conversations I've ever experienced because I was still free to retain some sort of relationship with them, but it was made clear that I would be entirely disinherited. It was a difficult decision, yet I knew I couldn't spend their money or enjoy their farm if I was dead. The inheritance equated to blood money, my own blood, if I did what they asked. I finally left the faith and started testosterone in January 2016. From then on, the more I evolved into the man I knew myself to be, the easier my life became. Just three years later, I met my beautiful husband, Marco, and we began building our lives together. 
I recognize that not everyone will live the life of a queer trans man brought up in a bonkers religion. <laughs> Nor are they hoping for the reward of a pocket-sized, sensitive, intelligent, bearded Latin lover, such as my husband. <laughs> These gifts are for me. <laughs> but what I do know is each one of us are put into positions throughout our lives that ask us to be something or someone we are not. It could be in a familial or romantic relationship, a profession, or in extracurricular pursuits. But pretending to be someone we're not is damaging and disconnecting, especially over time. The one thing I know works against this painful separation from humanity and ourselves is to accept ourselves and one another for exactly who or what we are. It is then that we can ultimately see our valuable interconnection and fill our lives with meaning. This morning, I walked outside and felt the coolness of the air and was glad to welcome fall. We've just passed the equinox, one of the few days each year when we lift our heads to notice that the earth is always turning, turning, turning under our feet, and we are turning with it. We were born on a turning planet. We are turning people. Tonight, our Jewish friends will turn the page to a new year as they observe Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the holiest days of their year. The central practice of the Jewish High Holy Days is Teshuva, which means turning. What sort of turning? Sometimes it's translated repentance, sometimes return. It's hard to translate precisely, which is a signal that this is a very juicy word for spiritual transformation. <laughs> Most Jews think of it in terms of making amends, apologizing, going into the new year with a clean slate. But it's more than that. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik wrote that teshuva is a circular motion. He describes it as moving along the circumference of a circle. One seems to be getting farther and farther away from the starting point, yet actually one is getting closer and closer. The wheel of the year works the same way. What Jews call teshuva, says Rabbi Alan Liu, is a primal gesture, a primordial sense of the healing power of the journey we make through life, the time circling the bases, if you're a sports fan. He tells of the prophet Samuel who served the people of Israel in an annual circuit. Every year he went from Ramah to Bethel to Gilgal to Mitzpah, and finally back to Ramah again. The moment he left Ramah, he was already returning there. Everywhere he went, he was heading for home. Repentance is baked into this teshuva practice. 
Now, repentance gets a bad rap these days as more and more people reject such notions as original sin. But the truth is we're human. We blow it often. <laughs> we get stressed out. We get short with people. We treat our own bodies and our own minds like disposable products. We treat others like objects. Or we treat them like they're in our way. We don't always show up as our best selves. Repentance is therefore an irreplaceable quality of spiritual maturity. Far from outgrowing it, we ought to be leaning into it. Repentance is the real apology that your dad didn't force you to make. It's the apology that comes with a real commitment to change. Repentance is restitution, restoration, reparations. We need opportunities to be honest with ourselves about how we failed, and we need opportunities to make it right. And we need opportunities to receive forgiveness and grace. Teshiva is repentance as an act of coming home to ourselves and to each other. The falling leaves remind me at this time of year that everything returns to its source. All things become and ripen. All things become old. And all things become new again. It's that great circle turning over and over, or if you will, this great globe turning in the heavens, coming around to its start again every day, every moment. Grace, always available whenever we need it. Where is home for you today? Who deserves your apology today? From whom do you need forgiveness? To whom could you extend forgiveness? To where, to what, to whom are you returning? Or to whom do you long to return? Where can you soften your heart to allow love to take root? Spirit of mercy, when the horn sounds, let it shake our hearts a little. Make sure we don't cover our ears. Open us up to each other and to the great turning of the world. Amen.
Kelly Garrett, and I represent you on the Board of Trustees. We all drink from wells we did not dig. This is as it should be. When I started attending the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, this was said every Sunday before the offertory. As a newcomer, I'd never thought of offering in this way. It was compelling. Pay now, feed forward, because somebody did it for you in the past. We all drink from wells we did not dig. Fast forward 20 years, I recently dug a well. Well, I didn't personally dig the well, but, because you have to have a special license to do that, uh, but I got a team that did it and made our way through all of the regulations and paperwork with the Utah Water Division. And finally, the drill team rolled the equipment up the hill and started drilling. This, like many endeavors requiring long range vision, required a team. Our team, we had Nikki, the self-described geeky geologist who studied the rock composition. We had Freddie, who looking like a Harley Davidson biker gang, and he was frequently at the top of the 60 foot well rig. And then John managed the crew, looking ahead for possibilities and pitfalls, reassuring me that we'd probably hit water any day now. So for weeks, that massive drill rig chewed through granite, producing only a few broken parts and requiring a couple of backup generators. We doubted if we would hit water. We were wondering how deep we should go and how much it would plunge us further into debt. But it worked out. We hit water. Eventually, the blue drill rig was back on the truck and crept down the hill to another hopeful spot. 
And now, when I turn on the tap, I may be more likely to think about how cold the water is on my hands, rather than really ponder what it all took to get the water there. How quickly I can forget. The ease I'm experiencing now came only after a team of hardworking people lent their talents to a project for weeks and weeks. Are we doing that here too? We're sitting on red woolly cushions, resting on wood pews or in seats or maybe on your sofa at home. Do we know who made them or how they got here? How did this chalice get here? Who bought the coffee that's brewing next door? What preparation did our volunteer teachers take to lead the kids in their activities today? Who's gonna shovel the snow come winter? And who's gonna make sure that the solar panels are getting the sustainable return on investment that we hoped for? How do we ensure the things that we want the things we need from this place will be here in the future. Here, we dig the wells. We dig the wells with the vision that there are others who will benefit both now and in the future. It starts with each of us renewing our commitment to give our time, our financial support, along with offering our vulnerable hearts to this community. That's why I give, that's why I'm taking my turn on the Board of Trustees, because I have benefited from those who worked on making this place a sustainable home for spiritual inquiry and renewal. And it's my turn to do my part. And if I'm being honest, um, the longer I'm here, the more fun it's getting. And my connections to others here grow deeper. I hope that I will see many of you at the activities fair later today. Um, some of you will be behind the tables, thank you. Others will be seeking and curious. And I hope that many of you will be ready to join a team and volunteer to dig a well. Maybe you're more like Freddie and you can join the building and grounds team to check on the solar panels. By the way, you don't have to go up on the roof to do that. Um, or maybe you're more like John and you can help us cultivate leadership in our community. You can stop by the Board of Trustees table for that. But whoever you are, whatever skills you bring, there's a place for you here. We all drink from wells we did not dig. This is as it should be. That's why I'm a steward. The offering will now be gratefully received. Uh, you can Say hello to one of the volunteer ushers who are passing by the beautiful wood plates. Or you can pull out the QR code on this bookmark. And I also invite you to say hello to someone seated next to you. Oh, sorry. Sure. <laughs> so one place that we really need volunteers is in ushers. We actually don't have any ushers this morning, so please stop by the hospitality table and sign up. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Karen. In his uh, book, 
Song of the Bird. Father Anthony DeMello shares a short parable where he writes, A man found an eagle's egg and put it in a nest of the barnyard hen. The eaglet hatched with a brood of chicks and grew up with them. All his life, the eagle did what the barnyard chicks did, thinking he was a barnyard chicken. He scratched the earth for worms and insects. He, he clucked and cackled, and he would thrash his wings and fly a few feet into the air. Years passed, and the eagle grew very old. And one day, he saw a magnificent bird above him in the cloudless sky. It glided in graceful majesty among the powerful wind currents with scarcely a beat of its strong golden wings. The old eagle looked up in awe. Who is that? he asked. That's the eagle. King of the birds, says his neighbor. He belongs to the sky. We belong to the earth. We're chickens. So the eagle lived and died. A chicken, for that's what he thought he was. That's an unsettling parable because, of course, it's not written for birds. <laughs> it is written for us. And it's written so that we might ask, which bird am I? Which bird do I think I am? A human. People came up to me during the, the ten, you know, after the, in, during the 10 o'clock hour, and one person was like, wait, where? They were like, I'm a seagull. <laughs> Another person was like, I'm a raven. And, and anyways, so feel free to think about it. <laughs> Which bird do I think I am? What's the song of my bird? It's the song of my bird. And perhaps... We should be easy with ourselves as we ask these questions. There's a pernicious strain of thinking within our culture that is constantly telling us that we are not enough. Look at the eagles flying above our heads. Right? Unfortunately, too many of those so-called eagles that we're asked to look at in the sky are not eagles at all. They are members of the celebrity culture, or they are the super wealthy, who are given status simply because they're rich, with no weight to how they got at that. So many of the so-called eagles that were asked to witness and worship are actually just vultures. It's just hard to tell from a silhouette, you know, particularly when we're not trained to notice the difference. So these questions require practice, discipline, discernment. On any given day, I can ask myself whether I'm an eagle or a chicken and get confused because the question is not whether I am asked, whether or not I am sailing above other people. The question is, am I living the life that I'm supposed to be living? The line, the eagle is the king of the birds, does imply that eagles are better than chickens. And I didn't get this during the second service, maybe I, but I was like, I know some UU is going to come up to me and be like, I register a complaint. <laughs> All birds are equal. <laughs> Take it up with the parable teller. I think DeMello's main point is that the eagle was not living the life he was supposed to live. Right? And there was a whole other world waiting for him, but he couldn't see it. He couldn't believe it. When we ask, which bird am I? What bird do I think I am? What's the song of my bird? What we are really asking is not whether we are flying too low and should we be flying above others, but are we living the lives we're supposed to be living? No. I, I, think, I think yes. I think we got, oh, no, yes. You're, sometimes that's true. We're not. <laughs> That's good. That I love that you know that. Because <laughs> change is possible at that point, right? <laughs> God, it's like, look, this is like a Baptist service today. We got 
We're running long. We got people talking back. I'm like, this is, this is church. Uh, where was I? Uh, when we're asking these types of questions, you know, we're able to move away from envy and jealousy and insecurity, which is the shadow side of the, that comparison culture, right? And we move into sort of existential, deeper questions, the questions of our existence, the meaning of our lives, the purpose, the why. In this space, there's no comparison with another. We're not asking if we're living as eagles or as chickens compared to someone else's life. We're, we ask if we're living the life that our soul sings about. Are you living the life that your soul sings about? I was waiting for my co-minister. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> now, maybe you don't know what your soul sings about. And, you know, I'm not convinced that the soul doesn't change songs from time to time. It could be that the soul has one sort of eternal, lasting song, and that we just interpret the song differently over the course of our lives. You know, sometimes I like Leonard Cohen how, in how he sings the song Hallelujah. I like how he does it. And then I also like how Jeff Buckley does it, and he, how he sings Hallelujah. Sometimes I like how Katie Lang sings Hallelujah. There is a song, there is a song that lives within us. And there are different expressions of it over the course of our lives. I know for myself, I've sung this song as a minister, as an artist, as a publisher of a magazine. It hasn't always brought me money. I haven't always soared to the high heavens, but I've enjoyed it. Most of it, a good portion of it. And maybe the soul sings, begins to sing a radically different song at different parts of our lives. The important part is not that we figure it out. That leads us into complacency. The, the soul might start singing in a different key. It might start singing to a different tempo. It might start singing a different arrangement altogether. But we're too often, too often we're not paying attention any longer because we've figured out who we are. And we haven't bothered to check in to see if it's still true. Or even if it was true in the first place. Somebody may have told us that it was true. Right? Someone told this guy his name was Jim. Is that your name? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> it might have been Jimmy at one point. It might have been James at another. It depends on what they're accusing you. Yes. <laughs> if it's James, you know he's in trouble. <laughs> What's the song of your life? Listening to the song initially can seem frightening. All right? We might look around and we see the stuff that we have, the relationships we have, the status we have, the have, we have, we have, we have, we have. Right? And we're afraid that if we, if we really get spiritual, like really spiritual, and we really listen to our song, uh, the song's going to be like, you need to throw it all away. You need to move into the desert and be like Jesus. <laughs> or be like the Buddha. Renounce everything. And people are like, I don't want that song. <laughs> you know? I don't want my song to tell me that my stuff has no meaning. Because I've spent a lot of time accumulating this stuff. <laughs> and, you know, on some level, there is a question there. Right? Because we've been told to acquire, we've been told to desire, but is that true? Does it really satisfy? That is a question. But I don't think that stuff has anything to do with the song of our lives. It can be there, it, can, it cannot be there. For some people, the absence of stuff is really just stuff in another form, right? This was the problem for the Buddha. He thought that being a penniless ascetic would bring him happiness. But it didn't. Because he was attached to being a penniless ascetic. 
He was not listening to what his soul was actually singing. And it was only when he did that he could take the rice milk, right? the rice pudding, and find the middle way. Stuff or no stuff is not the issue. Really asking the question courageously is the issue. What's the song of your life? Are you singing along with it or are you trying to sing over it? Or maybe you're singing something that you think you should, but it really doesn't fit. Now, these are questions that we should handle tenderly. We shouldn't look away, but we should be tender. And I've said this before, but I understand where the concept of original sin comes from. I don't believe it. But I understand how it could arise as a belief system. There's something about the human experience that just feels, eh, that's the word. <laughs> ah, right? That's, and we use other words to explain it, words like unsatisfied, incomplete, frustrated, less than. But really, it's just this, ah. So it's no surprise, really, that a theologian came up with an idea that there's just something inherently wrong with us. And then a whole group of people believed him for centuries. It's not surprising. It's not true. It's not true, but it's not surprising. This is the story of the eagle and the chicken. People are willing to believe something about their true nature that they are inherently, inherently sinners, and they die believing it. So when we ask this question, let us be tender because it would be very easy to fall into the story that has lived with us for so long that we're unable to be satisfied, that we're not enough, that we're failures, blah, 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 blah. This thinking keeps us stuck in living the life of some other being. Still, we must ask the question because the answer may be no. Right? I may not be singing the song of my soul. I may be living as a chicken when really I'm an eagle. And the question is still important when you're able to answer, yes. Yes, I am living the song of my soul. Because it's not as if everything is easy when you're following the longing that's within you. Right? We will all have moments of doubt and struggle. That's the life of the seeker. One of the worst pieces of advice that has ever spread amongst people is the idea that if you find what you love, you will never work a day in your life. I love what I do. I love what I do. There are some days. <laughs> there are some days. Let's just leave it there. But I love what I do. I, I love it. Anything worth striving for involves sacrifice. It involves struggle. It involves difficult choices. The life of the seeker, the life of the spiritually adept, the lover of God, is not about security. It is about authenticity. Authenticity. We are constantly looking to see if the ground that we are standing on is holy, and if it's not, then it's time to move. even if that ground feels familiar, even if it feels comfortable because it's known, because we know it. A prisoner can learn the cells of his cell so intimately that he may not want to leave, but it does not mean that he is free. It's more important to live authentically than it is to live with what's familiar. After last week's sermon, I received a number of emails asking really good questions, truly. Some quite pointed questions, which I take as a sign of success. Because if you ever want to let me know that the sermon was garbage, you can just come up and say, what do you, what do you say? Oh, it was really nice. That was nice. Oh, that was so nice. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll tell you, to the 10 o'clock, people were kept coming up going, that sermon was really nice. Ha, ha, ha. 
I was like, you chuckleheads. But really, I'd rather have someone tell me why they thought differently, right? You should never listen to what I am preaching about and just take it on faith because it sounded good or it made you feel a certain way. You should find out for yourself if what I said is true or true for you. You know, one email came in from a man who'd been raised religiously and had, he'd experienced a number of emotional, spiritual experiences that confirmed that the faith he was raised in was the right one. Maybe there's some other people in here like that. And he'd since left that faith and then rightfully began wondering how he could trust what he was feeling. Where do we find authority? If it can't be the group, if it can't be the scriptures, if it can't be the individual, because Lord knows, as individuals, we can believe some wacky things. And it's a good question, but it could spiral into nihilism or solipsism, right? So my answer is nuanced because there isn't a truth, not in the modernist sense. There's no essential truth out there. There's no essential God out there, or I don't believe that. God isn't a fixed thing. So my answer is that you need all three sources of authority. You need kind of to be in a matrix of things, the group, the scriptures, the individual experience. The nuance is if your group, your scriptures, and your individual experience grants itself exclusive authority and said, this is the truth, and I mean that for the individual as well, then you might actually be in some trouble. People get manipulated because the experience of longing of that greater connection, that sense that lives within us, is real. We know that we're interwoven. We know that we're part of something larger. It's just that some groups and scriptures and even individuals put a fence around this experience of longing and tell you that only the stuff that's inside the fence is valid. And when you've been hurt by traditions that did this, well, it's hard to place trust again in that inward journey because of the manipulation. Your group, your scripture, your individual experience must hold questioning as a value. And I mean this even for us. Like Some of you may love Unitarian Universalism right now, and it may be really helping you figure out what you are singing, what your soul is singing, what's singing through you. But in the future, this may change. And what is said may no longer feed you, and you need to go find out what is true, even if it means you don't see these people on a regular basis. Because living authentically is more important than living what is familiar. And we don't want you to stay. Not because we want you to leave. But because we want you to live what is most authentic. That's what we really value. If that means you're here with us living your most authentic self, that's what I want for you. If you're like, man, I found this other place. It's awesome. It really says, I am happy for you. I am happy for you. I don't need you to agree with me so that I know I'm right. Because I don't know that I'm right. I am constantly testing and playing with my understanding of love. Don't believe me just because I said it. Go find out for yourself. And if I can be helpful, if this community can be helpful, if some of what we read together and study together is helpful, fantastic. My greatest hope is that you are living authentically. That is the purpose of this community. Not to tell you the truth, but to support one another in our mutual search for authenticity. So who are you? What is your purpose? What are you singing? What is singing through you? We are always singing something. It just may be the cluck of another creature, which suits them perfectly, but it may not be who you are. And I mean this as an individual and as a congregation. 
The courage to ask these questions is not about being fearless. We are going to experience some anxiety, fear. And we go and we ask them anyway. You know, we, the, we go in with a, with a shining light into the shadows, regardless of what we might find there. And there's a voice that's going to tell us that if we, if we go into the unknown, it's going to be full of trolls and goblins. And this is what our ancestors heard when they talked about original sin. That's as far as they got. They never really looked, and as a result, they lived and died unaware of what they truly were. They thought they were sinners. But they weren't. They and you are born out of great blessing. You are born out of great blessing. You are designed to glide in graceful majesty among the powerful wind currents with scarcely a beat of your golden strong wings. This is not This does not mean that you're supposed to be famous or that you're supposed to be above others. It simply means that you are supposed to live the song that is moving through you, the song of the golden eagle that you are. And in each refrain, we hear the holy praise. Hallelujah. Our closing hymn is hymn number 1040.
source of life. God, my darling, in the great hush, may we be able to hear the song moving through us, singing of the worth and dignity of every being. On and on, the worth and dignity of every being. Awaken us to the great interdependence, the interwovenness of all existence, the space beyond birth and death, of truths, of fences. Awaken us to the presence. And fill us with grace so that we might find the courage to ask the question that is closest to our heart. Am I living authentically? So we might move into living who we are supposed to be. Amen. Special thank you to Beck and to Kelly, um, also to Tristan and everyone who makes it possible for us to go out there, to David, thank you so much, Monica, and who's missed them? Me. Right? <laughs> Welcome back. Hey, yeah. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, outside, you will find a falafel and shawarma truck, but also an activities fair. You should come for both of those. Come on outside and I'll see you there. There's some coffee and stuff because we're UVUs. All right. See you soon. <laughs>